Well, in the month of July, we just had so much fun during our series, The Bible Says What? Because when you read the Bible, you're like, you, you read some passages, some verses, and you're like, what? It was so much fun that this is like a kind of a continuation. It's sort of like version two or the second season as we're going to focus during the month of August on Jesus said, what? Not only does the Bible say some things that make you go, hmm, but Jesus said some things that you're like, wait, hold on. I thought Jesus was loving and kind and compassionate. <laughs> he is, but Jesus could also be gangster in moments. <laughs> and we're diving into one of those moments right now here in Matthew chapter 16, beginning of verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, just give as much as you want to give. Whoever wants to be my disciple, just show up on Sunday morning for an hour and do whatever else you want to do. Whoever wants to be my disciple, just have a Bible at your house for whenever, you know, life gets really bad. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. God, I thank you in the next few moments that we would not be offended by the words of Jesus, but that we would learn and we would grow, not just in our heads, but in our hearts, what it is to, to truly not just make it into heaven, but to be your disciples here on earth, to live the lives you've called us to live. So no matter how we walked in today, let us walk out more like Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, Jesus could say some things. This was Peter. Like he loved Peter. Look, look at someone you love right now and just say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> say, you devil, you. you. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus, he had taken his disciples to, to, to Caesarea Philippi. Now, this is significant because this area had a lot of different beliefs, a lot of different religions, a lot of pagan gods. <laughs> they, they would pray to, to the sun god, and they would pray to the moon god. When they wanted rain, they would pray to, to this god. There was so much pagan superstition. We can be a little like that today. I remember in, back in high school, I was on a travel baseball team. It was a really good team. And we would, we would try, this was now, there's, everyone has a travel baseball team. But back then, it was like the area had won. And we went to a tournament in Arizona. And one of the guys on the team was superstitious. Like whenever our team would win, he would not wash his socks. And he would wear the same socks. So after a few wins in 120 degrees, uh, I was like praying, Lord, help us lose. Like, what do we need to do to throw this game? He, he was superstitious. All these thoughts on, on this God and on that God and praying to this deity and to, to that deity. And it's in this area that Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Can you imagine if you did that today? You're walking out today and you just walk up to some people and be like, who do people say I am? You'd be like, you're crazy. <laughs> who, are we? 
Like, like what is wrong with you? It sounds arrogant. It, say, it sounds wild. It sounds like something only like our politicians would do <laughs> or like celebrities would do. Tell me all about me. Let's have, let's have ceremonies and awards for me. But that's not Jesus' heart. They were like, well, some, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're this prophet. <laughs> some say you're that. Uh, people had a lot of opinions about who Jesus was. You will not find out who Jesus is by taking a poll. You're not going to find out who Jesus is by us having a vote. A lot of opinions today on who people think Jesus is. Some people are like, Jesus, he was a good teacher. Like, really? He, he can't be just a good teacher because he taught he was the son of God, which would mean he would be a liar or a lunatic. <laughs> like, you're, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And so Jesus now shifts into another question with his disciples. Not who do people say that I am. He says, who do you say that I am? It doesn't matter what anyone else says. It doesn't matter who other people think God is. What matters is who do you think God is? What matters is who do you say God is? And Peter spoke up because Peter always had something to say, even when Peter had nothing to say. Peter was like, any question? You know, there's not a question. Peter's talking. And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, woo flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but, but my Father who is in heaven, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven like Peter got it right. Like Peter was right on. Was Jesus was like, ding, 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 you got the correct answer people have a lot of opinions about Jesus, but disciples, we need a conviction about this is who Jesus is. This is, this is, it doesn't matter who other people think he is, what matters is who I know Jesus to be in my own life. And yet here in verse 21, something shifts. You ever gone through a shift in life? Like suddenly you're, all the kids are gone and there's a shift. You're an empty nester. A shift, you went from being employed to no longer employed. There, there was a shift, a, a shift. And Jesus is shifting here. The emphasis in his ministry here in Matthew, verse 21 of chapter 16. And he goes from teaching the crowds in parables to preparing his disciples. See, up to this point, Jesus had talked parables, and like they were awesome. There was so much wisdom, so much truth to be found as Jesus would talk about sowing, as Jesus would talk about the lost one, and, and people were learning about who Jesus is and, and the kingdom of God. But now Jesus is shifting to prepare his disciples for what? For his death and for his departure. Because, guys, it's about to get real. <laughs> People, it's about, I now need to prepare you because things are going to be different. And Jesus tells them, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And they were like, they were shocked. Like, what? You ever been shocked at the last presidential debate? You try to put on those pants from a few years ago? <laughs> you ever just been shocked? Go grocery shopping? You just... they, they were shocked. They, they were stunned. Like, well, we, we weren't expecting that. Jesus, we followed you because we thought we were going to conquer. Not because you were going to suffer and then die. So Peter, Peter pulls off a mom move. Come on, this is a total mom move. He takes Jesus, Jesus, come on. 
he pulls him to the side. Anyone ever have your mom do that? I remember as a kid, we'd be in a store and I wouldn't be listening and I wouldn't be listening. Daniel James Reed, and she'd grab my hand. You know, it's hard. <laughs> You're like, ah, you pull me aside because she's, she's not gonna discipline me in front of everyone. And Peter pulls Jesus aside away from all the other disciples. <laughs> and he's like, uh, Jesus, I don't think so. Uh-uh, homie, don't play that. Like, you're like, no, this is, you will not do this. This is not going to happen. Peter is telling Jesus what to do. And many of us are like, how dare he? And yet we do it all the time. In our alone time with Jesus, let me tell you, I, I told you that this person is sick. I told you that I need something financially. We have is like he's telling Jesus. I can relate to Peter because Peter is extreme. There was one moment Jesus is like, Who am I? And he's like, You are the Messiah, you're the Son of God. <laughs> and Jesus is like, Oh, flesh and blood, Peter got it right. This is the very next moment. This is not a year later. This is not a month later. This is not even a week or a day later. This is the very next moment Peter is getting it wrong. Does anyone know what it's like? You, you got it right one moment and then totally wrong the next? There's days I'm like, yeah, I think I was a really good husband today. <laughs> and then there's other days where I'm like, I think I was a really bad husband today. At the nine, Lindsay's like, yep. <laughs> you didn't, yep, the really good days. <laughs> sometimes it's not even days, sometimes it's just moments. Like, yeah, I was a really good spouse this moment, and then it's like this very next moment. You ever just feel like it's like a coin, the same coin, there's heads and there's tails? And like this one moment, you're living bold for Jesus and you're standing up for people who are being marginalized and then the next moment, you're afraid to speak up? One moment, like you don't care, you're like you want everyone to know that you're a Jesus follower and then the next moment, you're like, uh. the very next moment. Peter's getting it wrong. And so Jesus, loving Jesus, compassionate Jesus, <laughs> inclusive Jesus, <laughs> goes over and gives Peter a hug and a kiss. And he says, it's okay, it's okay. we all get it wrong sometimes. <laughs> he says, get behind me, Satan. That is like, Jesus said, what? He said, get behind me, Satan. Now, is he saying that Peter is demon-possessed? Satan means adversary. There are times that we are in alignment in our lives, in our words, in our actions, with the will of God. And then there's other times that we are out of alignment with the will and the ways of God. You see, in that very next, like, it's like at one moment, he, Jesus is like, upon that confession, I'm gonna build my church. And the next moment, you better move out of the way. Get behind me because this is in opposition to what I came here to build and what I came here to do. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus says, you're a stumbling block. Isn't this interesting that just a moment ago, Jesus had said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the very next moment, he's like, upon this rock, other people are going to be stumbling over it. On their... That's how we can be too, people. It's like, it's, just, it's not just what we are. It's what we are doing with what we are. In this moment, are we aligned? Are we following Jesus? Or in this moment, are we working against the very thing God wants to do? Not just in our lives, but in the world. Peter was concerned not with what God was concerned about. Jesus is like, you have human concerns. Isn't it interesting how so many of our concerns are human concerns. We even come into God's house. It's just like, it, like we're concerned about our relative who's sick. We're concerned 
about how little, how little money we have in the bank. We're concerned with how crazy our spouse is acting. We're concerned with... Like, how many of us, like, if, are genuinely concerned coming in here? It's like, God, how can we build your kingdom? When it was offering time, it's like, God, how much can I give? How much do I trust you? Versus... We get time to, to get involved and serve. It's like, uh, well, I got things to do. My yard, my, my house needs to be cleaned. Concerns. Are, are, are concerns, is it just about our lives or is it about what God is concerned about? Reaching a world that is hurting and lost and broken. It, here's what we see with Peter. We see in our lives is great passion needs great and clear perspective. What's most important? What is most important? Uh, Peter uh, is struggling here with an issue. We have issues. And part of the issue is theological. The theological. It's like, wait, okay. The theological issue Peter and the other disciples are probably struggling with here is, wait, you're going to suffer and die. I thought you're supposed to conquer. We have theological issues. Some of us are like here like, I, I don't understand if there is a God, why this bad situation's happening. I don't understand if there is a God, then why is it my family member who has cancer? I don't understand if, it is a, why, if there is a God, why I am struggling with this depression on the inside. It's theological. See, but right there, I just actually made it practical because the issue is not just theological, it's practical. Where the, the issue is not just why is there bad things in the world, it's practical, why are there bad things in my life? Why am I depressed? Why am I struggling financially? Why is it my family member who's sick? We live in this culture that is pretty self-absorbed. Like you travel the world, which I would encourage if you're ever able to, you go to different parts of, of the world and you see people who make decisions based upon what is best for the community. How does my life impact the community where we live in this Western culture where as long as my actions don't cause harm to anyone else, I should be able to do and I want to do whatever I want to do when I want to do it as long as it's not hurting anyone else. You can. But maybe there's a different, a different way. The, there's a, a philosophy that the enemy wants us to buy into. That you can have glory without suffering, that you can have success without hard work. And so it's like, just take the shortcuts. Like, it's okay to cheat on your taxes. Like, really, what's the government going to do with just that? Is that money really going to make that big of a difference? Like, you could do more with it, and after all, so many people do it anyway. Maybe you're not satisfied in your marriage, so you start cheating on your spouse. Well, after all, this percentage of people cheat on their spouses anyway. And, you know, and it's just, and this is the shortcut to fulfill. But here's God's philosophy. Is you're going to suffer? No one's saying amen to that. Amen. Here's God's philosophy. It doesn't end there. You're going to suffer but I'm gonna transform that suffering into glory. That the greatest things in your life are gonna come from the hardest moments. You see, there is no crown without a cross. And many of us, we want the crown, but we don't wanna, we don't wanna deal with the, with the cross. And so Jesus, he, he tells his disciples, you need to deny yourself. Oh, in our in our culture today, deny yourself? No, you got to just, you got to, your real identity is giving into your desires. That is being your authentic self. That's what the world wants us to think. You just feel like it, do it. You're going to end up in debt with all kinds of issues, medical 
psychological. We'll just do it like, to deny yourself is not the same as self-denial. And some people think that it's spiritual just to deny certain things. Oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm denying myself. How? Well, food-wise, it gets really quiet in church, if you ever talk about food, by the way. <laughs> Some people are like, I'm just, you know, I'm seeking Jesus, so I'm denying myself. I'm not eating spinach or broccoli right now, <laughs> and I'm doing it for the Lord. It's like, What? You're not doing that for the Lord. To de like deny yourself doesn't just mean that you're denying things. What it means is that you're giving yourself fully over to God. That you're saying, I am going to be obedient to God's guidance. I'm going to be obedient to God's word because there are some times that your desires want to take you a different direction. I'm going to stay faithful to my spouse even though I don't feel like it. I'm going to be a, a person of character and dignity even though I feel like it. <laughs> not be like, wait, you're saying, God, I'm going to keep following you, not just giving in to these desires. It's not like saying it's not all about me, my wants, my desires, my things. You can live for yourself or you can live for God. It, Jesus says, deny yourself. Take up your cross. I think people don't really understand what take up your cross means. We think like to take up your cross means like, you know, Jesus carried this heavy cross. So like, you know, we think it's extra spiritual to be like, to look miserable. You know any cranky Christians? <laughs> Just suffering for the Lord. I'm carrying my cross. It's like, I thought the yoke was supposed to be easy. I thought the burden was supposed to be light. Like, it, it's not just like, wait, hold on. It just doesn't mean that I'm going to be miserable my whole life. What this means is I'm going to identify with Christ. Watch this. We love identifying with Christ when we say, oh, I'm, I'm identifying with Christ. Everyone, we live in this world of everything's identity, right? Identity politics. Everyone's putting these things before their names, like, they like, but like for me, it's like we should identify with Christ. I'm a child of God. I, they, you you got to know like you are loved, you are forgiven, you've been redeemed, you've been bought with a price, that, that you are the head and not the tail, that you are going over and not under, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we love to clap about that, but we also need to identify with his suffering. So we're like, well, but, but why am I going through hard times? Identify with his shame that was trying to put on, like on it, like people were trying to put shame on. Identify with, with his crucifixion. Uh, Luke, in his account of what's transpiring here, Luke says, it, Luke's articulating what Jesus said, to pick up your cross daily. Daily. I don't know about you, but like, this is not a one time decision to follow Jesus. This is a decision you make every day. Every day, because your desires are gonna to wanna to take you one way, but it's gotta be, no, but I'm going this way. Every single day, am I gonna follow the world or am I gonna follow Jesus? Every single day, am I gonna do it the easy way, what seems easy, or am I gonna do it God's way? Because here's the thing, the, the enemy promises you glory, but in the end, it ends up with suffering. But God says, God's promised you suffering, but that he's gonna transform it into glory. That you, with God, suffering is never wasted. It always leads to glory. And Jesus tells him, he says, hey, he says, guys, whoever wants to save their life is gonna lose it. But whoever loses their life for me is gonna find their life. Anyone ever just been so surprised at people that you think are a success? Like they have it all, you think? Maybe it's like a famous actor, actress. Maybe some business entrepreneur. 
all of a sudden you're just like surprised because later on in life they commit suicide. And you're like, but they had everything I thought I would have wanted. And you realize how miserable they were, even people who don't commit suicide, but they get to that point and they're like, everything that, I thought this was supposed to be, and now they just feel lost. Because when you do it the enemy's way, when you do it the world's way, you get to a point, and even if you get things, you realize on the inside, I'm lost. (laughs) And you realize, and I'm alone. Not only do I not have a strong relationship with Jesus, but, but other believers around me. But when you lose yourself for the sake of Christ, I'm not just talking about just losing yourself for any, I'm talking about when you say, I am dying to myself so I can live for Christ. You actually find yourself. Amen. You discover like, whoa, this is what life really is. You have a peace that passes understanding. You have a joy that doesn't come from nice things. It's a joy. People are like, I want, I want that kind of joy. It only happens when you say, I am dying to myself so I can actually live for Christ. I want you to know, here Jesus, he's not talking with his disciples about going to heaven. This is, not, this is not about just going to heaven. He's talking with these individuals how to make the most of their life here on earth. That's the context for for our conversation today. Is that this is not like, oh, how do I get into heaven? I just want to get. No, this is saying, how do you make the most of your life here on earth? See, so many people who live under their potential, who live under their calling, God does not make accidents, God doesn't make mediocre, God doesn't just make just less than. God has created you for so much more, but you will not discover it doing it the world's way. You will not discover it taking the shortcuts. You discover it by following God. You discover it by saying, I'm going to deny myself. I am going to pick up my cross. I am going to follow Jesus. And as I lose myself in following him, I actually found myself. This is, this is devotion. A lot of people come to Jesus desperate. You might have come to church here desperate today. In just a moment, you'll have an opportunity to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But that's not what this passage is all about. Because you can find, you, I say find Jesus, Jesus actually found you, you just think you found him, but the, you can come and into a relationship with Jesus out of desperation, and a lot of people do. A lot of people go through a trauma, and then they end up finding the love of a savior. A lot of people have a family that just falls apart, and that leads them into being open to a relationship with Jesus, but, but desperation might take you there, but desperation can't keep you there. And desperation cannot keep moving you forward. You, a lo, desperation alone, it's got to be devotion. It's got to be that, that, I don't really feel like doing this, but I, I know it's the right thing. I don't really sense, you know, it's, this isn't a popular thing, but I'm going to keep following Jesus. I don't want you to waste any of your potential I want you to invest all you have into everything God has created you to be and he's calling you to accomplish. You have so many opportunities. Don't miss those opportunities. Invest your life. And whatever you give up, whatever you suffer, whatever you go through as a struggle in following Jesus, you will receive far more in return. And I'm not just talking about heaven. We have a God who transforms suffering into glory. Who, who says it, it's like, it seems, it doesn't make sense to us because we live in this world where it's like we just think we just need to win and we just think we go from, you know, glory to glory. We sing songs like that. We go from glory to glory, but there's valleys in between the mountaintops. And the greatest things are birthed out of the greatest struggles. 
Think about what Jesus went through and think about what God accomplished through the suffering servant, his son, Jesus Christ. If you only knew what God is going to do through your suffering, if you only know and could just, ex- just comprehend what God is going to transform your pain into, it'll all, it'll all make sense. It'll all be worth it, but we don't understand it and we don't comprehend it till we get there and we look back and we say, oh, God, all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been good, so don't give up. Here's what I want you to know. You're going to suffer either way. You do it the world's way, it's just going to be a surprise. I thought, I thought, I thought, no, you're surprised by the suffering. You do it God's way, you're not surprised, and you realize you don't stay in that suffering state, that God takes you into a glory that can only come from him.